So last class was on uh, the awakening heart and what we call the Brahma Viharas. Brahma Viharas, uh, for those that are, are new, are it's another word for the divine abode or the the home that is within each of us and is our true nature that we experience. And, and there's different flavors of it. And the first flavor we explored was loving kindness or a loving presence. And uh, the second flavor we explored was compassion. Now love is what arises when we wake up and see the goodness and the beauty. And it's a quality of appreciation and care that comes from seeing the truth of what's here. Compassion is the quality of love that emerges when we see the suffering that's here, another part of truth, and that our hearts get really tender. Tonight we are going to be exploring the third of the Brahma Viharas, which is joy. And joy is really, if, well, the way I understand it, it's really a quality of love for life that arises when we open to that space and includes the 10,000 joys and sorrows, that which is beautiful, that which is difficult. It's a quality of profound openness that itself is an expression of freedom. Now, I've shared that on my way to giving a talk, for the week that I know I'm giving a talk, it, the talk theme provides a filter. So I knew that, okay, my filter right now is joy. And I want to confess that I had a bit of wariness about it. <laughs> because right now my life has been really dense. It's you know very demanding and busy and stressful. And so I kind of have locked in a little bit of, of a kind of a grim, you know, get it, get through, get through the day kind of mentality. So okay, joy. So part of what I'll be, <laughs> you know, what I'll be sharing a little bit is, you know, how did this filter work out? for me uh, this week. And um, I will share also that I had a, a little helper. And um, our family has adopted now two new dogs. And one of them I've really gotten to know um, over these last weeks. Uh, her name's Katie. And she's this little bundle of joie de vivre, you know. <laughs> she's just like, she is absolutely enthusiastic about every part of life you can imagine. And you'll, I'll have her on the leash, and she'll go bounding after a squirrel, and I'll yank her back. And for about, you know, 0.02 of a second, she's a little disappointed, but then she's bounding out after the next thing, and um, she's just enjoying the moments. And she's not planning things, and she's not thinking about the past. And uh, so she's way more evolved than me in that way. <laughs> in that way. Um, it really made me think of, of joy as, you know, given our habitual modes, um, not so easily accessible for some of us. Um, so I wanted to share a quote from Yid that I often think of. It goes like this. Know that joy is rarer, more difficult and more beautiful than sadness. Once you make this all-important discovery, you must embrace joy as a moral obligation. That's strong language, right? <laughs> a moral obligation. So first, rare, you know. When I speak to people about joy, it, it sounds like, well, that's the fruit of the practice when 30 years from now I've learned to really, you know, sit and quiet my mind for long periods of time. And, but no, it, 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 it feels rare because of our habits, but it's right there and possible. So he's saying it's possible, and yet, you know, we know how locked in we get to the stress person mentality. So rare but possible. And then moral obligation. And for me, the, the meaning of that is that if we intuit this possibility that we really can open in that way and feel that, just that love of aliveness, then it comes to be a commitment to our wholeness. It's like if we're committed to our wholeness, to really experiencing all that we are, we commit to paying attention to this 
to turning towards that possibility. So obligation, I think of as possibility, as, as this commitment. And it reminded me of a story a friend told me um, some years ago. She was you know, co-facilitating a diversity workshop. And one of the women in the group, an African-American woman, shared her experience of having spent many years raising four children, single mother, um, when the economy crashed, she lost her job. Really, really rough. She went through bouts of, of you know, health problems. And she hit a point where she had locked into just what I was describing, that kind of grimness of, you know, life is about getting through the day. And then something in her snapped and she said, wait a minute, I have a choice. And so she did an experiment where she committed herself to choosing to be open to joy, to happiness, to joy. And, and she described just committing herself to pay attention in that direction. It's like it cracked the door open and more and more light and fresh air came through. She started noticing things she hadn't noticed that brought her happiness, simple things. Still having, still, still a rough life, but having, you know, those, that kind of currents of, oh, yeah, I can love this anyway. So we'll come back to her at some point, but I just want to invite you to reflect for a moment, because I'd like to really ground this, this exploration together. How do we approach that? I mean, do we sense how much joy is in our life or not? You might close your eyes and just think of this week. And just scan through the week and sense, were there moments that you were aware of joy, of a kind of uncomplicated well-being, happiness, not wanting things different, appreciating how it is? So we're scanning without judging, just to sense, were there moments? And if so, what was, what was it? What was going on? Were there some simple, beautiful experiences that you just paused for and sensed, oh yeah, loving life? For some, you might notice how it was rare, that there weren't many moments that you were kind of speeding through, maybe, uh, you know, on the, on the surface level, racing past things. But just to notice that. And then ask yourself, what would it be like, what might happen if I considered deepening my commitment? This is a commitment to wholeness, to opening to to this possibility of touching joy, of discovering this love of life, just as it is. What would that be like to deepen my commitment to choosing happiness, as this woman did it in this diversity group, to choosing it, to challenging the grimness, So as you listen, you might sense the the possibility just giving yourself permission to kind of check it out, what's possible here. So we begin, as as I like to, with a little bit touching in more deeply to what makes it so difficult. Because understanding that gives us a sense of, of care and not judging. And my basic understanding is, for me, in the moments when I'm controlling things, I'm trying to make things happen, make myself different, make somebody else different, get things done, and there's a tension, a torque to it. When I'm in managed life routine, then my senses are not open to the world that's here. The the joy that's potentially there does not arise. Controlling and joy don't seem to go together. Does that make sense? Okay, (laughs) thought we'd be on the same page here. (laughs) 
And most of us are, like, when you think about it, long stretches of time, we're on. We're on figuring out and manipulating and controlling and trying to impress and so on. And my favorite way of describing this comes from Pema Chodron. She says, being preoccupied in these ways. She says, it's like being deaf and blind. It's like standing in the middle of a vast field of wildflowers with a black hood over our heart, our heads. It's like coming upon a tree of singing birds while wearing earplugs. Because we're not listening to the birds. We're listening to our thoughts about what we should be doing, right? Or what somebody else should do differently. We see joy more in, I mean, my, my new dog, we see joy, but we see joy in, in young children. You really do. It's um, amazing to watch. And, and why? Well, they're not so habituated around doing and fixing and defending. And uh, there's just more free space for spontaneity. Favorite story some of you might remember by the illustrator Maurice Sendak, what he describes Uh, really expresses this to me when uh, he says, one day a boy sent me a charming card with a little drawing, and I loved it, and I answer all my children's letters. But he says, uh, sometimes uh, very hastily, but this one I lingered over. He said, I sent him a card, and I drew a picture of a wild thing on it. I wrote, Dear Jim, I loved your card. Then I got a letter back from his mother, and she said, Jim loved your card so much, he ate it. And he said, that was, to me, one of the highest compliments I've ever received. <laughs> he didn't care it was an original Maurice Sendak drawing or anything. He saw it. He loved it. He ate it. <laughs> so just a little moment to honor Maurice Sendak, who passed away recently. But that, his drawings had that in it. They had joy. Wild things. So the alchemy of joy if you have to kind of sense it out, is a combination of openness and flow. Feel it in your body. When you feel joy, when you feel love of life, there's an openness that lets it all be as it is. And in that openness, life can play fully. And its uh, play is just fully vibrant, dynamic, creative, spontaneous. Openness and flow. And I'm putting that out there because as we practice together, those are the two qualities we'll be exploring in a very meditative way that open us to joy. So when we start inquiring what's between me and that, you know, like in this moment, what is between me and joy? We often find, well, there wasn't enough attentiveness or quietness. We might discover that. I just wasn't really open to it. We're messing the openness. Or in some way, what we discover is, well, what's between me and joy is I'm not just allowing the flow, I'm defending against something that's going to happen that could be bad, or I'm trying to hold on to some part of it to try to get more. So there's openness and flow, and what's between me and that? Well, we're usually trying to manage the flow, right? So then we look at the ways that we try to manage it. And here we get to, I think the Buddhists are very articulate and they describe uh, the near enemy of joy and then the full enemy of joy. And they really are talking about the shadow side. The near enemy of joy is attachment. It's like we get excited about something, you know, get excited about a person or about a course we're going to take or something we're learning or something we're going to eat or whatever it is. But rather than just opening to that life and letting it move through us, There's some grasping, some controlling. It's like a good friend of mine who uh, was describing her uh, a new romantic relationship, and with the the aliveness and the warmth of her heart, there was also this sense of always computing: Is he the one? (laughs) You know, is he the one? So there was that grasping. You know how uh, it's described this way. He who binds to himself a joy does the winged life destroy. But he who kisses the joy as it flies by lives in eternity sunrise. Right? William Blake. So the near enemy is that rather than allowing the pleasure and the enjoyment, this isn't a, you know, it's like let it happen. Let it happen fully. Don't try to manage it. Control it. 
Then the full shadow side, the full enemy of, of joy, is actually pushing away that aliveness. And we have certain beliefs, and you can listen for what's yours, I find all of them in, in me somewhere, that, that keep on running through, that make us tense against the flow. And it's very physical, by the way, that when we're tensing against the flow, it's like if you really check your body, you can feel different chakras, the energy centers kind of tight, that aren't allowing life to move through us. So one of the beliefs is that it's just plain dangerous to relax and enjoy because when there's pleasure, it's followed by pain. There's some punishment. And that there's some personal history that for many people program that in. That just when we were letting our guard down and enjoying things and playing, in some way we got unexpectedly um, sidelined and, and creamed, punished, you know, some uh, unanticipated temper tantrum from the parent to us or whatever it was. But So we get punished for enjoying. That's, that's one of the beliefs. Another one of the beliefs is that uh, in those moments we should be doing something else. Now, William James, was the, I read it, he describes this ceaseless frenzy. And he described this, what, 150 years ago, was it now? <laughs> then there was a ceaseless frenzy, too, <laughs> just in case you thought this was the only generation. But he said that's it, that the ceaseless frenzy where everyone thinks they should be doing something else. Do you know that feeling? It doesn't matter what you're doing, you're trying to complete it to get on to something else. How many of you know that feeling? Can I... Two hands? Okay. So that actually blocks us. That, that sense of leaning forward and that this isn't the moment that really counts. The attitude that goes with joy is that this is it. This right here. I mean, like, and I'm not even speaking metaphorically, like this, this moment. It's to enter into the center of now. Like, really get it, that we're not waiting for something. And then, in that full hereness, we're not leaning forward, we're not... Then the life can flow through us. We become this openness that life flows through. Okay, so that's the second belief, is that it's not now, and I should be doing something else. Now, the third belief is being here is painful. That if I get here... I'm going to open to layers of vulnerability that I don't want to. It'll be too much. There's some truth to it. You know, there's a reason that there's a a kind of an avoidance of practicing meditation. There's kind of a love-hate relationship because when we get very here, we do open to the layers we've been running from. So that's part of the process. And the deep understanding is that if we don't defend against them, then we become this openness and they can continue to unfold and we become the space that aliveness happens in. It's okay, we can handle unpleasantness. Rilke puts it this way, and this is, he's talking to God at first. He says, embody me. Flare up like flame and make big shadows I can move in. And then he speaks to us. He says, let everything happen to you, beauty and terror. So can you sense joy takes a kind of courage to just let life be as it is? And that was really the theme of tonight's meditation. You know, we can do a certain amount to get ourselves collected and quiet, and we can use certain phrases and guide ourselves and coach ourselves. But ultimately, with joy, we have to put down all the doings and be this openness that life just plays through. So that's the third belief, that it's not safe to do that. It's not safe to open to the layers. It's dangerous. And and the mood of joy is saying, yes, it's uncomfortable. And yes, sometimes because there's trauma and it can feel like too much, we have to go really, really gradually. And we need support. It's not like we need to dive into the cold water all at once. But that's the direction. The direction is to say yes. 
Zorba the Greek, you might remember this one from him. He says, am I not a man? And is a man not stupid? <laughs> you know? He says, I'm a man, so I married. Wife, children, house, everything. The full catastrophe. You know? <laughs> but that's part of the attitude. It's like, okay, let's just live this life. That's part of of the choosing. That's part of what this woman in that diversity group was saying. It's, okay, it's hard, and I'm choosing life. And in that choosing and in that openness, we discover the beauty. And we rest in a kind of freedom that is exquisite. The full catastrophe. So the idea with this is that anything we're pushing away prevents us from experiencing joy. And when we judge, and judge is one of the biggest ways we push away. When we're not forgiving, when we're holding a grudge, in those moments we have basically armored ourselves from joy. Judgment and joy don't go together. So let's, we'll shift a little and say, okay, so how do we, given our conditioning, given our habitual ways of defending against aliveness and controlling, and we all have our whole repertoire. How do we come back home into this potential we have of openness and flow, of joy? Um, you can spend time with my puppy if you want. <laughs> That's a really, I mean, she really is a teacher, and I'm watching her and sensing, gosh, she just really lives it. So here's the verse that I find most useful. This is Dorothy Hunt. She says, In this choiceless, never-ending flow of life, there is an infinite array of choices. One alone brings happiness. To love what is. To love what is. Now, we might think, love what is, it sounds like a beautiful idea, but when what is is painful or seems horrible in some way, how do we love that? And to say that love with the seed of loving what is, is simply being present with what is. Our presence will open us to the love. It doesn't have to be like we have this expectation that whatever arises, we're going to embrace it with massive amount of tenderness and courage. It's just this willingness, and this is really the beginning of a joyful heart, this willingness to be with the life that's here, as much as we can. Love what is. So uh, when I wrote Radical Acceptance, um, I really emphasized what I've described as the yes meditation for that reason, because I found for myself that that was a really powerful joy training. And uh, the story many of you have heard, I remember when I kind of created it for myself, I was at a six-week retreat, and I had gotten to a point where I was feeling um, really sick, and there was a lot of physical unpleasantness, and there was window wars, which meant that some of the yogis liked the windows open, and some liked them closed, and so everybody was, you know, kind of fighting over how the windows were going to be in the hall that we were sitting in, and some of the teachers were talking a lot, so you sit a long time listening to talks, always makes me self-conscious when I say that. But I, so I was, not only was it unpleasant, I mean, I was, I had a lot of complaint in my brain. You know, when you go around with just a lot of complaint, well, it was a complaining brain. <laughs> so, so I started doing this thing where I said to myself, okay, and this is my first, like, commitment to happiness. You know, I'm just going to say yes to whatever appears. So at first it was this mechanical labeling of what came up. You know, it would be like, you know, annoyance, Yes, you know, feeling heavy and sick and achy, yes, you know, judging, yes. So I just throw on the label, yes. And then it became kind of amusing, like just, just kind of plastering on the label. Well, the amusement kind of lightened me a little bit. And then I found that every time I said yes, there was a little more space around it. So my sense of who I was wasn't so much locked into the experience of not liking something, 
I was resting more in that presence that was just agreeing. That's the shift that starts moving us towards joy. And then through it, because when you're at a long retreat, you get a lot of time to practice with stuff. Um, Even though I'd get lost again, I'd come back to yes meditation. Gradually I found that there was just more and more of inhabiting and allowing space that became very tender and sometimes quite cheerful, to my surprise. So yes, and and when I say yes, um, I don't mean that for you a yes meditation means you have to use the word yes. Yes, it's an attitude. It's an attitude of agreeing to the life that's already here. Awareness already accepts what's here. It's like whatever's happening, awareness has already accepted it. Awareness doesn't resist. And what the yes meditation does is it allows us to re-inhabit the awareness, the very qualities of who we are in our natural state. Not fighting, not managing, not controlling. When we do, when we become that allowing space and just aliveness is happening, pleasant, unpleasant, there is a natural quality, uh, a kind of a bubble that kind of, it's kind of explosive and large and light-filled that we call joy. Openness and flow. So we'll just take a moment. Let's, let's do a little yes meditation now just to touch into it. There's a real simplicity with this one. We pause we invite our attention into what's right here. So just kind of come down into the body. Just feeling the body from the inside out, whether there's pleasantness or unpleasantness. You might feel your heart from the inside out and just sense whatever the quality, mood is of the heart. Let your intention be to allow the life that's here to be just as it is. You're just noticing and letting be. And if there's anything that you see a tendency to resist, Just explore adding on that, yes, that real intentional agreement, that willingness to let the life that's here play itself as it is. So it might be yes to a little discomfort somewhere in your back. It might be yes to a squeeze of anxiety in the heart. might be yes to something you feel sad about. Or it might be yes to a feeling of excitement. And notice what happens. The yes is actually, it's as if in a cellular way you're absolutely agreeing to let life be as it is. Notice what happens. You might sense what it would mean to even deepen that yes. A surrendering presence. Just become the space. That this outpouring aliveness lives through.
loving what is, allowing presence with what's right here, cherishing this life. Okay, so that is the first part of a kind of commitment to awakening joy, which is what I'm calling the yes meditation, which is a mindful presence with with the life that's here, loving what is. Mm -hmm.